got diagnosed with cancer last week and then her brother passed away later in the week. Remember my brother Ray, he's still in, um, on the ventilator at ICU. They're going to try to wing him off this morning, um, but he needs your prayers. Thank you. 
those who filled in last week in my absence and uh, I was preaching at Georgetown and uh, I just heard you had a tremendous day in the Lord so we just thank the Lord can we give him a hand clap of praise <laughs> all right he about baptized himself <laughs> amen we have here uh, brother William and sister Kelly and uh, they come to us um, about a year ago, I guess, a little more, a little more than a year, and uh, they come from uh, another denomination. They come from the Salvation Army, and uh, we are so truly thankful to have them. And, uh, and we, I believe that God has great things for their life, as as I do everyone. And uh, they really feel like God has a calling and a purpose for them, and I agree with them. And uh, but they want to be baptized again. It's been several years, and God's doing new things in their life, and we're going to do that. We're going to baptize them as representation of that. If you'll step up a little bit. Right. I promise you we'll bring you back there. <laughs> right. Brother William, do you profess to know Jesus Christ uh, in full part of your sin? Yes. It is my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the <laughs> Son, and the Holy Ghost.
want to exalt you for just a minute in the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 7, says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of earth, of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. I want to exalt you for a minute. Some of you may come in here today and you may be carrying the weight of this world upon your shoulders and you feel like you can't make it another step. Paul knows how that feels. And he's writing to Corinthians and he says, let me tell you something, this vessel, this earthen vessel that you're walking around in, honey, you are carrying the power and the anointing of an almighty God. Amen.
for your anointing power, for your life-changing power. We're thankful for your healing power, your power of provision, your power that changes lives and changes a culture, your power that changes us. We bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. He's good. If you have your Bibles, you will turn to the book of Ruth, chapter 1, and verse number 21. Then we'll be going to 2 Kings chapter 4, and we'll be starting at verse 1. The Word of God says, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. This is a hurting lady. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets to Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said to her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me. Kind of a crazy question, right? What hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow the vessels abroad of thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out unto all these vessels thou shalt set aside that which is full. And she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons and brought the vessels to her and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me yet a vessel. And he said to her, there is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay thy debt and live thy, thou and thy children of the rest. Every time I've ever preached on this, I've always preached on the vessel and the importance of the vessel. But today I want to talk to you about the power of emptiness. Share with you for a few moments. Can we pray? Father, we love you. And I'm thankful for the revelation of your word. Lord, we ask that your spirit will be a revelator today. That you'll hide me behind the cross and that you will reveal your power, your touch, your anointing to your people. I pray that you'll save someone today. That they'll know who Jesus is when they leave here. Touch lives. Hide me behind the cross, anoint every heart, mind, soul, spirit, and ear to receive and send the anointing that makes preaching life-changing. We thank you for your goodness. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and we believe. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Summer is quickly approaching, right? It's already getting hot outside. Yes. Somebody said, thank the Lord. That was Sister Clara. <laughs> there are a few things in life more disappointing then it's a hot summer day and you've got your Route 44 cup of water from Sonic or wherever your place of choice is. And you're drinking from a straw and you are thirsty and it's hot. And all of a sudden you hear that dreaded sound of the straw running out of water. You know what I'm talking about, right? That dreaded sound and you take your straw and you start poking the cup. Anyone ever done that? Amen. That slurping sound that just will not go away. And you know what that means because time has taught you and experience has taught you that that sound means the cup is empty. The cup has run out of resources to give. You see, if you don't have the resources to fill your cup back up, you know that thirst is empty. Can I get a witness? 
We read here about two separate occasions. In these separate occasions, you had two women and both of them were experiencing emptiness. Now, I know I don't want to be a doom and gloom preacher because I understand, Sister Claire, according to Psalms chapter 23, verse 5, that our cup runs over in the Lord. Can I get a witness? Amen. I know according to uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 3, Acts eleven twenty four, 24, that we can be full of the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Ghost filled them. Uh, John chapter 16, verse 24, that our joy is made full whenever we know who Jesus is. So I know there is fullness in knowing God. Amen? Amen. But I also know that if you live long enough, you will go through a season when you feel a time of emptiness. Right. Being real today. It doesn't mean God's not good. It doesn't mean He's not there. It means there are not enough resources to do what needs to be done. You don't know the answer to your salute to the problem or the dilemma. You don't know the solution. The problem may seem impossible and the good report may seem improbable. You know what I'm talking about. Times when there are more tears and smiles, questions and answers. More pain than joy. Those times when we just feel empty. Anyone else ever felt that way? Philippians chapter 4 verse 12. The Apostle Paul is talking. He says, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. I know how to have plenty. I know how to have little in other words. Or to put it in context of the day's message. I know how to be full. But I also know how to feel empty. Yes. Yes. Nevertheless, I've learned this thing. That I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Whether I'm on the mountaintop or in the valley. Whether I'm dancing for joy or crying for pain. I can do all things through Christ even when I feel as if I'm empty. In 2 Kings chapter 4, Elisha is, is fairly new to his ministry. He has performed about six miracles of his 28 noted miracles in the Word. And in chapter number 4, a woman comes to Elisha and she has problems. She has problems. Not just one problem, but she has many problems. Chapter 4 verse 1, will you pull that up for me on the... On, on the uh, screen, if you would. In chapter 4, verse 1, you find there's a woman whose husband, uh, there now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. Just leave it up there if you don't mind. She has a problem. She is struggling because of the death of her Husband. She's dealing with emotional pain that comes with death. She's dealing with loss. She is now a widow. It's safe to say she is hurting and with all rights. She should be hurting because she's experiencing the loss of her husband. My husband, your servant is dead. Now, let me make something clear. She has lots of problems, but she's a woman of faith. She's a woman of faith. How do you know that, Pastor? Well, first of all, she had enough faith to go to the man of God. That tells me she come from some good stock. She knew where to go when she needed help. She was a woman of faith. Uh, she was also, her husband was a, one of the sons of the prophets who was in the school of the prophets, if you would. So her and her husband would have been considered in the ministry. She was a woman of faith. We're not exempt from problems just because we're a faith, folks. We're not exempt from trouble. We're not exempt from pain. So here she is. My husband's dead. She's going through all this pain. But not only does she have an emotional problem with her pain, she also has financial trouble because her husband owed money. Her husband owed a debt, and now she could not pay it. And the creditor has come. To take her sons to be servants to pay off their father's debts. So she's got uh, emotional pain. She has financial pain. And doesn't make everything worse. She's completely out of resources. She can't pay the bill. The creditors come. And this is just going to add to her pain. Because now she's lost her husband. She's broke. And now she's going to lose her sons. It's a bad day folks. And Brother Wayne, to add
add to everything. She is struggling spiritually. Because look at what she says. Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knew, thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. But the creditors still come. In other words, my husband was a man of faith. I'm a woman of faith. I don't understand this. It doesn't make sense to me. Why have I tried to serve him and my husband honored God? You know, Elisha, my husband honored God, but I'm still experiencing this pain. And he honored God. He respected God. And now his sons are going to be servants to a creditor. There are times in life, has anyone ever said, God, why? This doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand why this is going on like this. You know, in those moments, uh, listen to me, in those moments that we don't understand, and if you've been saved very long, you've had a why moment, a moment where it just didn't add up and it didn't make sense. It's in those moments we've got to do what she did. She turned to the man of God. At that time, the prophet represented the voice of God. He was the mouthpiece of God. So in, re- in essence, she was turning to God in her time of trouble. When you don't know what to do and you're out of options and you're out of resources and nothing makes sense, don't turn to the world. Don't turn to the right or the left. Always turn to the place where your help comes from. She says, this doesn't make sense. I'm, you know my husband served the Lord. He feared the Lord. And now we've got all these problems. It's bad enough when one thing is wrong. On. Right, Brother Wayne? <laughs> I'm not going to tell your stories. But there's another friend of mine. <laughs> I probably shouldn't tell his stories either. <laughs> but you know when problems come, and one problem leads to another. And you try to fix that, and you cause another problem. Yes, nice. And by the end of this thing, you're just in a great big mess. <laughs> yes. This woman had an everything was wrong kind of day. Yeah. Everything was wrong. She was dealing with death, with pain, with loneliness, with questions, with debt, with family issues, with children. Yeah. Let's just be real. Everything in her life was bad. Yeah. Find right. one good thing in her life at this moment. It was all bad. She goes to the man of God. She goes to him. Now, we don't know how many other things she's done try. We don't know if she's been to the bank and borrowed money. We don't know. If she's anything like us, before we try God, we don't try 15 other things. Oh. Preach on, Pastor. You tear it up today. We done caught all the nephews and we found out they broke too. We don't know how many resources she's exhausted. We don't know what she's done. We don't know if she turned to a family. We don't know if she went knocking on the doors trying to find a kinsman redeemer, someone to be her husband, someone. We, we don't know what she done. The Bible doesn't say. But this one thing we do know is she was in a place of emptiness. We know this because she looks at the man of God and he says, what is in your house? And she says nothing. Except... A pot of oil. And I don't even have anything to cook. All I've got is the oil. So in her place of desperation, she's looking for help. She's looking for a solution. And there's no one else to turn to. Sounds like us sometimes. When we're out of options, we turn to God. Then verse 2, the man of God looks at her and says, what do you have? She says, nothing. Except the pot of oil. I want you to understand something. That oil throughout the Bible has almost in every case been a representation of the work of the Holy Spirit. In almost every case when you read about oil in the Word of God, you'll find it's, it's a representation of the work of the Holy Ghost among men. 
Exodus chapter 30, they anointed the priest with oil. They dumped oil on his head. The oil would run down the beard of the priest and drip down to be a representation of how the anointing flows from the top downward. In Psalms chapter 89, we read of how God anoints someone to be king. We see whenever, whenever Samuel went to David, he took oil and anointed him to be the king of the people of God. We read in Exodus chapter 27 how there was a lantern in the house of God that had to burn day and night and night and day and day and night and night and day. And every morning the priests would have to go in there and pour oil inside those lamps so that they would never go out. We read about Matthew chapter 25. The, 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 the women that were waiting on the bridegroom to come. Uh, they were the virgins that were waiting on the bridegroom to come. It was the oil that kept the lamps burning so that they would be prepared and ready for the return of the bridegroom. In James chapter 5, we see how we would anoint the sick with oil and the prayer of faith does what? Heals the sick. We read in Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 26 that, that is, it is the anointing of God that breaks every yoke. The oil is always a representation of the oil. What are you saying to me, Pastor? I'm saying whatever you lose, don't you lose your oil. Your family may be broken, but you keep the oil. Your money may be broken, but you keep your oil. You may be broke and out of options, but you keep the oil. You, you may have job issues, you keep your oil. You may be about to go to court, but you keep your oil. You may be sick, but you keep your oil because the oil is a representation of the work of the Holy Ghost in your life. You can get a new house, get a new job, you can find a new friend, but my blessing, God, don't lose the oil. Amen. If there was anything she was going to have, at least she had oil. Amen. And the man of God looks at her, and then he says this. He looks at her and he says, go to your neighbors. I have a crazy question. What do we do normally whenever we get empty? We focus on what? All of our attention goes inwardly on our problems. On our issues. On our stuff. And it's just about us. But the man of God told her something interesting. He said, go to your neighbors. <laughs> And I imagine she was thinking, man, this is great. I'm going to go to my neighbors and they're going to give me money. <laughs> that would have made perfect sense. Yes, Lord. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. But he doesn't say go to your neighbors and get their money or their resources. He says go to your neighbors and gather all their emptiness. Go to your neighbors and gather their emptiness. Get their empty pots. Lord, you sure you don't want me to get something put in it? <laughs> Maybe they can put a little... Can we take up a love offering before I leave their house? <laughs> he says, no, God, their emptiness. Go get their empty pot. You know, oftentimes we think it's all about us, guys. Revelation chapter number six. You find we're supposed to bear one another's burdens. That's right. Read throughout scripture, you'll find we need each other. That's right. And you can get on the gospel train by yourself. And I know as long as I got King Jesus sings real good, but the Bible teaches that we're supposed to be a unified body. We need one. Right. I need you, you need me. And and go get some emptiness. So she sends her sons, and her sons go and say, hey, can I have your emptiness? Can I have your empty pots? And the, the prophet not only said, go gather their empty pots, he said, gather not a few. Get a lot of emptiness. That's exactly what I want to do. Just get a lot of emptiness to go along with my emptiness, so we're just all empty together. We're all empty together. <laughs> go gather their emptiness. And bring it into your house. Bring your neighbor's emptiness to your house. I want to share something about emptiness for a moment. You know, God can do a lot more with an empty pot than you can a pot that's full. You know what I do when I'm cooking? 
I burn stuff normally. But, <laughs> but, but if, if, if I have too much stuff for the pot, my wife will look at me and she says, that pot's not big enough. So you know what we do? We get a bigger pot. Because the pot's full. So we just do what? We get a bigger pot. And that's what God can do more with an empty pot because when our pot's full, we're self-sufficient. I got this, Jesus. My cup is full. But when the pot begins to get empty and the bill's been mailed, but the money's not there yet. When the child's gone crazy and you can't figure it out, the doctor's report is questionable. All these things. When the pot is empty, you know what? There's more room to fill an empty pot up. And God says, there's more room for me in an empty pot than there is with a pot full of you and your resources and your money and your thought processes. There's more, there's more room for him when we become empty. What I don't want to do is the pot's too full, I just get a bigger pot. So what we want to do, we want to hold on to all of us. Our agenda, our thoughts, our, all of our stuff. We want to hold on to it. And the pot's full. And God says, hey, there's not room in there for me. Don't worry, Jesus. I'll just get a bigger pot. Right. I just need to get a bigger pot. And God says, I don't want you to have a bigger pot. I want you to empty out the pot you've already got. Yeah. So there's room for me in there. Yeah. The power of emptiness. She's empty. And she goes and gets everybody else's emptiness. And the prophet told her to do something crazy. He says, I want you to take what you have. And I want you to pour it in your neighbor's pots. At this point, she didn't know what she was going to do with that oil. All she knew is this pot was not her pot. So she has just a little bit of oil. Not much, but she has just a little bit, and she begins to pour what little bit she has into somebody else's emptiness. She begins to pour what little bit she has into somebody else's emptiness. And in her own emptiness, she becomes a symbol of the ministry. And even though she was empty herself, she said, you know what? It's not about me. It's about me blessing somebody else. And I'm going to take the oil and obey the man of God. And I don't have much, but I'm going to pour it into somebody else's emptiness. I want you to know something that in your own emptiness and brokenness, you will find there is power in taking what you need and pouring it into somebody else's emptiness. And you'll find that God will increase what you have. What do you say? Looks at her sons and says, Hey, you got more pots? They 
said, no, no, she's into this thing at this point. I will tell you, I go find some more pots. As long as she had pots. The oil kept pouring. Listen to me, folks. As long as we'll keep the heart to minister and pour into the lives of other people, I promise you the oil will never stop flowing. I promise you, I promise you, if it stops, I'll stop preaching. The oil will not stop pouring as long as you keep the spirit to pour into the lives of somebody else. And she's pouring of herself. But when she did not have any more vessels to pour into, what happened? The oil stopped. She stopped because she ran out of vessels. But if we ever stop pouring into someone else's emptiness, the oil will not, there will not be a standing supply just to stay in our store outside, folks. But if we'll keep pouring in, she goes to the man of God and says, hey, you're not going to believe what happened. We went bar into this and we bar into this and my sons brought it back. And when they brought it back, we started pouring into all these pots. And then the pots just kept filling up and they kept bringing pots and I kept pouring and they kept bringing pots and I kept pouring. And, and you're just not going to believe My house is so full of oil as a fire hazard. You just would not believe it. It's overflowing with the oil. You're not going to believe it. And the man of God looks at her. He says, take Take what you need and go sell it. You sell it and you pay your debts. And then the rest of it, you go and your sons, you go and you live on it. So understand, she went from in seven verses from being a beggar, a woman in dire need of help, to being an entrepreneur who was out there selling oil. In the name of Jesus, Amen. I come to tell you, your situation may be dire. You may not know what's next. But if we will obey what thus said the word of God and pour into the work of ministry, the oil will keep flowing and God will make a way where there is no way to stand over in this house if you will. The oil kept flowing and in seven verses God changed her life. You want to know what to change your life? Obviously if you don't know Jesus it's seven is your Lord. But if you'll be committed, and I'll be committed to take what God has put in us, whatever He's given us, just give it back to Him. God, where are you going to that? I don't care if the pot is beat up and shabby and has writing on the side, smell of this is your pot. I don't care if it's riding on the side or if it's nice and shiny like this pot. We love poor shiny pots. It makes good sense to us. I wish I brought some peanut pots to my house. We love poor pots that look good. But if we'll just pour, God will take care of the oil. The moment we start picking and choosing what pots we're willing to pour in is the moment the oil starts. We start picking and choosing where the oil goes, the oil will stop just like that. She filled up every vessel she had. Listen, folks, there's emptiness all around at the church of God. There's emptiness in your families. There's emptiness all around us. And maybe you're here and you're feeling pretty empty yourself. Listen, if we'll be committed to pour into their emptiness, God will let the oil flow to fill our emptiness. No, we'll look around for just a moment. Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, 